pure. Once the first drop of liquid is squeezed out, less than an egg bulk of food remains and it cannot render the liquid impure by inference. If you squeeze more than an egg bulk... Hayoter mikabetsa tame. This implies if it's greater than an egg, the liquid extracted will be contaminated by them. By them. The e amrat mashke habale ochel ochel but if you say a beverage that's extracted for food is itself a food, the may it kasher. With what does it become susceptible? Hu hu motivla vehu mefarekla. Revin asked this question and he answered as well. The case of one who squeezes into a bowl. An empty bowl. Ah, so one who squeezes into an empty bowl. So that's the case where it becomes tuma. Where it, because the juice is considered a liquid, remember before? Right, it's not considered food. Food. Ama Rabhirmia Ketanai, this is a disputed name. Hamachalik ba'anavim, a baker rubs his loaves with grapes, so it gives the crust some shine. Lo huchshar, the grapes do not become susceptible to tumah. Through contact with the juice that emerges from them, that's curious. Rabbi Yehuda Omer. Hoksha, they do become susceptible to the juice that gets, uh, that oozes out as you rub them. My love, the ha- it's not, it doesn't mean to say that they are susceptible. It doesn't mean to say they are tuma. It means they're susceptible yeah. to tuma. Yeah. My love, the ha kamiflage. Is it not in this that they disagree? Masava mashka balo The one master the Tanakama holds that a beverage extracted for food is regarded as food. Or master I love Ochelhu. And the other master, Rabbi Huda, holds that it's not regarded as food as food. And it will be susceptible, can be susceptible to Tuma. Ama Rapapa. Tchule Alma. Mashke Habale Ochelav Ochelhu. All agree a beverage extracted for use. Uh, in food is not food. The hacha b'mashke habala ibud kemiflage. However, they disagree here with a beverage that's extracted to be discarded, uh, meaning that the juice is heated and evaporated in the oven. Uh, as the liquid that dripped into the bread eventually evaporates due to the heat. Right. Masavar. Mashkehu, so Rabbi Huda holds that a beverage uh, that's intended to be discarded is a beverage or a liquid. Or Masava love Mashkehu, but the other master, the Tanakama, holds that a beverage meant to be discarded is not considered a beverage. Or the Flugta de Hane Tanae, and this is. From another dispute of Tanaim, de Tanya, Usotna Braisa, Hamifatsea Bezetim Biadaim Meso Avot. If one bruises olives with unclean hands, so you had impure hands, mm. and then you bruise the olive, uh, it says here to soften the olives so they'll become sweet. Yeah? Yeah, well, you can say that. I don't see that that happens today. Huxha, they become susceptible to tuma, if because oil will kind of ooze out of them as, mm. you, as they get bruised. Le softan the melach, um, if you bruise them in order to dip them into salt. Lo huxha, they don't become susceptible. Leda im higiul zetav limsok in love. And if it's done in order to know whether or not his olives have arrived uh, at picking stage, 
Lo chuksha. They don't become susceptible. Rabbi Huda Omer, chuksha. They do become susceptible. My love the heart can be So what? What is it now that they disagree about? The master of mashke almedli bud mashkehu. For master Rabbi Huda holds that a beverage meant to be discarded is a beverage. Is a beverage. Well, master of love mashkehu. But the other master holds. Master holds the tana kama holds that a beverage meant to be discarded is not a beverage. Isn't that that's exactly the same as before? Is that what we just said before? Uh, Rabbi Hood holds that it, that it is a beverage and the Tanakama said that it's not a beverage. So it's exactly the same. Ama Rav Huna Bereja Rav Yoshua Hane Tanaye Bemashke Haomedli Bud Plige These Tanayim are disagreeing about a beverage meant to be discarded. Bahanach Tanaye Bamashke Haomed Litzach Techo Kamiflage. But those Tanaim are disputing about the juice on the baker's loaves are disagreeing about a beverage meant to lend a sheen to the food. Hmm. So following Steinsalz when they were talking <coughs> about <coughs> Squeezing the grape juice onto the bread. Yeah. The way I'm reading Steinsalz, the bread's being formed, and the man takes the grapes and squeezes the juice out, and then uses the juice to smooth out the surface of the bread. So then it'll take a sheen because there's a bit of sugar in the juice, and it'll take a sheen when it's in the. Yeah. Ama rabbi zera ama rab. Rav Chia Barashi Amarav Sochet Adam Eshkol Shel Anavim Latoch A person may squeeze a cluster of grapes into a pot with food in it on Shabbat because liquid that is squeezed directly into food is considered food rather than liquid Right However A valve Lo Latoch But not into a bowl However, a fish, for its brine, even into a bowl. A fish for its brine. That's a strange one. I'm wondering if we're talking about a, a fish that's been preserved in yeah. brine and salt water. And you take it and... You want a bit of fishy saltiness in whatever food you're dishing up, and you squeeze it to get it out of the fish. Or you're going to use it like a condiment, so you squeeze the juice out of the fish into a bowl. Then people can dip their veggies into it, or something like that, veggie sticks. Mm. Strange. Certainly, Rashi makes the point of saying that it's regarded as a food, not a beverage. Mm. Okay. A fish for its brine, even into a bowl. Yativ Rav Dimi Bakama la la hashmata. Rav Dimi was sitting and he repeated his teaching. Amale Abayla Rav Dimi. Atum Mishmeta Rav Matniti in Velok Hashelecho. You teach this in the name of Rav and it presents no difficulty for you. Anan Mishmeti Shmuel Matnitin La Vakashalan. We teach this ruling in the name of Shmuel, and it presents a difficulty for us. Miyamashmuel Daglatira Fila La Tohakara. Did Shmuel say a fish for its brine even into a bowl? By Yitma, but it's been, it was stated. Kavasamim, Kavasim, sorry, Kavasim Shishatan. The squeezing of pickled vegetables. Amar Rav. I see that's an interesting... See, it's pickled vegetables, which goes along with what you were saying before, like uh, pickled herring or whatever. 
Amarav, Legufan, uh, if you're squeezing it in order to for themselves, so to make them ready to eat, Mutar, then you can squeeze it out. Lemeim lemeimehen, but if you do it for their liquid, Patur Avalasur, you're exempt biblically, but the act is rabbinically prohibited. Or Shlakot, but boiled vegetables. Bain le gufan, bain le meimehen, whether it's for themselves or whether it's for their liquid, mutar, it's permitted. Or shmol amar, echad kevasim ve echad shlakot. Concerning both pickled and boiled vegetables, le gufan mutar, for themselves one is permitted, le meimehen, le meimehen, patur avalasur. For the liquid, one is exempt but the act is prohibited. Amale Ha'elokim By God Enai Ra'u Velozar My eyes saw and not a strangers. Uh, it's a note here. My eyes have seen it and not another's. A buyer asked whether or not this statement was attributed to Rav in order to resolve the difficulty with regard to Shmuel. These two statements are contradictory. Therefore, Rav Demi told him exactly who transmitted this halakha, declaring that each is a reliable source. Mm. The attribution to Rav <coughs> could therefore be relied upon as though they had heard the halakha directly from him. Mm. Mipume de Rabbi Yermia, Shmi Ali, the Rabbi Yermia, the Rabbi Zera, the Rabbi Zer, the Rabbi Chia, Barashi, the Rabbi Chia, Barashi, Merav. Oh, Merav! So it was actually Rav who taught the law. Gufa, the text itself. Rasim Shet Katan, squeezing the pickled vegetables. Amarav. The gufan for themselves, muta. Le memehen for their liquid, pator. Aval asor. Ushlakot for vegetables, ben le gufan, ben le memehen for themselves or whether for their liquid, muta. You getting all this? Yeah. Ushmal amar. But Shmuel said. Echadze, the echadze, the season, those pickled and boiled. Lugufan mutar, for the results it's permitted to squeeze them out. Lumemehem patura valasur. So, I just want to check where the difference is. So, Rav said, for themselves permitted, for the liquid exempt but prohibited. Bold vegetables, uh, they're both permitted. Now, Schmall said, pickled and boiled vegetables. Ah, so now, now, so Schmall's problem is with the pickled and boiled vegetables. Whereas Rav said, they're both permitted. Schmall says, for themselves it's permitted, and for their liquid it's prohibited. Yeah. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan Amar, Echad, <laughs> now a new one, Echad kevasim veechad shlakot, but pickled and boiled vegetables, legufan mutar, for themselves one is permitted, lememehen chayav chatat. For the liquid, one is liable to a chatat. And before you go, and I'll just read you the halacha, mm-hmm. which was squeezing by Torah law. Yeah. By Torah law, one is liable for squeezing only if one crushes grapes or olives to use the liquid. The prohibition to squeeze other types of fruit is by rabbinic law, in accordance with the sage of the school of Menashe. So what we're hearing now is something that is a view that is not the halacha. Huh? 
Right. Rev Yochanan holds that one is liable for squeezing out even a beverage mm. that did not originally come into existence within the fruit. He holds further that both pickled and boiled vegetables are items that it is usual to squeeze. Since the juice of these vegetables is accordingly deemed a, ve a beverage, one who squeezes it out will be liable. Okay. Thank you, Rev Yochanan. They challenged... Okay, so a challenge against, I think, all three. Sochatin kvasim b'shabbat l'torah ha-shabbat. We can squeeze pickled vegetables on Shabbat for use on Shabbat. Avalo l'motzei Shabbat, but not. Um, but you can't do it on Shabbat for use after Shabbat goes out. V'zeitim v'anavim, with for olives and grapes. Lo yizchot, you can't squeeze them on Shabbat at all. Kashilarav, this is a difficulty for Rav. Kashili Shmuel, difficulty for Shmuel. Kashila Rabbi Yochanan, and difficulty for Rabbi Yochanan. Rav Metaret Fotame, Rav resolves according to his opinion. Shmuel Metaret Fotame, Rabbi Yochanan Metaret Fotame. Rav Metaret Fotame, Sochatin Kevasim. The Shabbat, the Tzorah HaShabbat, Avalo Lematzei Shabbat. So you can squeeze pickled vegetables on Shabbat, for using on Shabbat, but not for use after Shabbat goes out. Bamed Varim Amorim, when are these words said? Legufan, this is in regard to the vegetables themselves. Aval mehem, but squeezing for their liquid. Patur avalasur. So that's for pickled vegetables, right? Ushlakot, for boiled vegetables. Then the gufen and the mehem mutar. The zeitim vanavim, olives and grapes. Lois Chod. You can't see the Chod at all. Im Sechad Hayav Katat. Okay. So I can see his his idea is that if it's pickled, then you've got something that's in there that was not originally in there. Mm. And the boiled vegetables, <coughs> um, you're permitted because... <coughs> yeah, it's water. I think what he's saying is that the, I'm guessing, um, that if you take the water that it was boiled in and you've just got the vegetables, mm. the liquid that's in the vegetables is what was there when you threw them in to be boiled. But pickled stuff, it's impossible. No. It's all. It's because the outside salted water has permeated and gotten out of it. Yeah. Shmuel metarat v'tamei. Okay, so how does Shmuel resolve it? Sochatin kvasim b'shabbat l'tzor ha'shabbat. Pickled vegetables you can squeeze for use on Shabbat. Hul hadin lishlakot. This is the same. The same law applies to boiled vegetables. Okay. So that's the same as Rav. The only time I just want to say, go back to Rav. Rav said. You're not well, this is sorry, okay, my apologies. The Mentorim Amarim, the Gufan, for themselves. So you can squeeze them for both pickled and boiled um, to eat the vegetables. Yes. A vowel hand, but for their liquid, pato aval asor. So he says for both, boiled and pickled, you can't use the liquid that comes out, or you can't do it. The zeitim vanavim, with olives and grapes, lo iskot, the im sachat chayav sachat. So like Dr. Seuss. Rabbi Yochanan, 
Mitzaris Lotame. Okay, how do they resolve it? So, Chatin Kavasim Be Shabbat Lotar Chashabat Ava Lom Lomatay Shabbat. So, he says the same about pickled vegetables. Notice that Rabbi Shmuel never said anything about for use after Shabbat. Did you say yeah. that? Uh, well, I, only because you brought it to my attention. So that's how Rabbi Yochanan talks about the pickled vegetables, same as Rav. Echad, kvatsim ve'echad shakot. Both pickled and to boiled vegetables. Bamed varim amarim, the gufan, avala memehem, lo ischot, the imsachat, na'ase kemi shesachat zetin, the anavim, the chayav chatat. So if you did squeeze them for the liquid, you're regarded just the same as one who squares for olives and grapes, and you're liable for a sin offering. A sin offering. How did he say it? Ah, so what he's saying is that it's a it's a Torah law that you're breaking. Wait till you get to Rashiya. Okay. Amar Rashiya Barashi Amar Rav. Zvatara. Eino chayav ela al drisat zeitim v'anavim bilvad. You're only liable for olives and great pressing. Yeah, but the uh, way it's pronounced here, we're only liable for stomping on olives and grapes. Chayav ela al drisat, which would suggest that squeezing them with your hand. Yes. It's permissible. Um, I'll just read the note here, if I may. Mm. It's a Torah principle that one is liable on the Shabbat only for malacha performed in its usual manner, which as regards the act of squeezing fruit is defined as squeezing a beverage from food. One is therefore liable for squeezing olives and grapes. The sins it is common practice to do so, the juice is legally regarded as a beverage. One is not liable, however, for squeezing other fruits. Okay, that doesn't help us at all. certainly brings a difference. I wonder if it's going to go on to talk about that. The Chen Tane Dvei Menashe, and this was taught as well in the Academy of Menashe, Dava Torah Eno Chayav Ela Al Trisat Zetim Vanavim Bivad. It's a Torah principle that one is liable only for stomping of olives and grapes. So this is very interesting. You've got two sources but what, read on, because it, this is very peculiar. The ein aid mipi aid kasher, and a witness, from the mouth of a witness, a single witness, you know. Mm. And a witness from the mouth of a witness is not a valid witness. So that's called, it's called, um, it's called, uh, what kind of testimony is that? Um, um, hearsay. Hearsay. Ella le edut isha bilvat, except with regard to testimony about the marital status of a woman. That's the one about the, the person who died. Yeah. The husband who died. Ibai lahu ed mi pi ed le edut bechor mahu. What's the law about a witness from the mouth of a witness? It's basically hearsay, right? Yeah. So what's the law about hearsay to offering testimony about the blemishes of a firstborn animal? Well, hearsay is permitting a priest to eat a firstborn animal. Okay. Yep. Rav Ami Asir. Rav Ami prohibits the Kohen based on hearsay. That's interesting, isn't it? So Rav Ami prohibits the Kohen from eating from the animal based on hearsay. Ravasi share, Ravasi permits. Amale Ravami le Ravasi, Bahata Nadeve Menasha, a Baraisa was taught in the Academy of Menasha, Ain Ed Mipi Ed, Kasher Ella le Edoti Shah, Bilvad, a witness, from the mouth of a witness. So he say is not valid except for testimony regarding a woman's marital status. So 
so in other words, how can Rav Asi um, accept the hearsay? Ema le'edut she'aisha she'ra la'bilvad. Say that testimony for which woman is valid, Rav right? Say. Do you want to, you want to read the expansion there? Yeah. It means the previously cited ruling and say, hearsay testimony is only valid in testimony for which the testimony of a woman is valid. Right. A woman's testimony is accepted with regard to the death of a man enabling his wife to remarry and it is also accepted with regard to a firstborn animal. So it's a lower level of evidence that a woman should say, obviously. <coughs> then it goes on about the Amar. There's something not clicking here. Okay, shall I read the notes? Um, can you, <coughs> would you mind just reading that part that you read again, that you, that you just read now? <coughs> okay. A dilemma was raised before the sages about a related matter with regard to hearsay testimony in testimony from permitting a priest to eat a firstborn animal. What is the halakha? After the destruction of the temple, the sages decreed that if a priest has the firstborn offspring of a kosher animal and it becomes blemished, he must bring witnesses to testify that he did not cause the blemish. Priests were suspected of violating the prohibition against inflicting a wound on firstborn animals to enable them to eat the animals, i.e., if it's been dedicated and it's it defective, then the priests get it. The question here pertains to a case in which there is no one available who can testify that he saw firsthand how the animal was blemished. But there is someone who heard from an eyewitness how the blemish was caused. Rav Ami prohibited accepting hearsay testimony in this case, and that Rav Asi permitted doing so. Peter, it sounds to me like what it's saying is is that we don't accept hearsay unless it comes from a woman, in which case we have to abide by it, and it's not necessarily anything to do with that marital status issue. It's actually hearsay from a woman, full stop, um, in regard to the blemish. Because that's... That the next bit goes, Rav Ami said to Rav Asi, didn't the school of the Menashe teach that hearsay testimony is only valid in testimony enabling a woman to remarry, indicating that it is not accepted in the case of a firstborn animal? Rav Asi replied, amend the previously cited ruling and say, hearsay testimony is only valid in testimony for which the testimony of a woman is valid. In other words, Hearsay testimony is only valid in a situation where in you would state. accept where you would accept evidence by a woman. And a woman evidence is valid where she's uh, giving testimony as to the death of her husband. Or another woman is giving testimony to Therefore, the husband. I think that's what's being said. Can I read a note here? Mm. So, chutz me'etut isha bilvad, which translates as except for the testimony of a woman. In its challenge, the Gemara understood this as a reference to testimony concerning a woman, i.e., testimony that allows her to remarry. The Gemara now explains the statement as referring to testimony offered by a woman which is valid in only a few limited instances. Mm. Is this... Does so Steinfeld... Yeah, that's what he's saying? Ah, okay. But the thing seems to be at this point, as I'm getting it, that in the normal court system of the time, mm. a woman was treated 
in the same way as a deaf mute right. or an idiot or a child, i.e., she couldn't, in a general case, she, she couldn't given, give evidence. She was only given limited instances uh, where it would and, be valid. And, and, you know, one of those instances is marital, st marital and status. And it seems here the a new one is the blemish. The blemish. Rav Yemar, Akshar Ad Mipi Eid Livchor, he validated hearsay. Right, hearsay regarding a firstborn animal. Kare Ale Kare Ale Miremar. Miremar referred to him as Yamar Share Bukhra, the permitter of the firstborn. Maremar was of the opinion that testimony of that kind is invalid and cannot provide the basis to allow the animal to be slaughtered. Mm. The Gemara concludes, and the Halakha is that hearsay testimony is valid with regard to a firstborn animal. And firstborn animals, of course, were the ones that were given to the priests. Mm. So it's saying if it had a blemish, it couldn't go to them? Saying that um, the witness could say that the beast had a blemish and, and a woman could do it. The beast had a blemish and it wasn't imposed on it by the priest in an attempt to have access to meat. It didn't have to be sort of burnt up on the altar. Right. If it has a blemish, it can't be brought as a sacrifice, but becomes mm -hmm. the property of the Kohen who may consume it as he pleases. Mm. Okay. Good. Move on. So do you want to do the testimony enabling a woman to be man or not? I mean, I'm just raising this. You mean a note? Here's a note here. Yeah, sure. I just want to stand up, sorry. Okay. This is referring to testimony that a woman's husband has died which permits her to remarry. Testimony from people whose testimony is not accepted in other <coughs> instances is accepted for this purpose, including a single witness, a witness providing second-hand testimony, uh, certain relatives, women slaves, a non-Jew who mentions it incidentally, and others. With regard to the reason for this leniency, see Rashi's commentary on the Gemara here. The Rambam explains that since testimony enabling a woman to remarry establishes a fact rather than a test to an action, and since if the testimony is false, the lie is likely to be exposed, it is not considered testimony in the formal legal sense of the term. I can ask. I think I understand what that means. Yeah. If I uh, bear testimony that a bottle of milk is white, it's something that can be instantly verified by someone looking at the bottle of milk. It's not as if I'm saying so-and-so uh, handed over a contract to so-and-so or so-and-so gave somebody a a uh, hundred dollars. In other words, it's verifiable? It's verifiable easily and simply by looking right. at the bottle of milk and seeing that it's white. So all so of a sudden if one day <coughs> her husband walks in the door? Yeah, then of course there's the obvious lie. <coughs> and anybody can see it's a lie. Chavot yeah. honeycombs, which is from the Mishnah, where they were chopped from before Shabbos, honey oozed from them, on Shabbos, it's forbidden to consume, but readily as Elazar permitted. Kiyata Rav Hashaya min Hadeya. Atav Ayete Matnita Bide, he came and brought a bridle with him. Zeti Manavim Shiriskan Me'er Shabbat, Vietzu Matma Nasurin. All the bridles were chopped from before Shabbos and their juice oozed on Shabbos of its own accord. It's forbidden to consume that liquid. The Rabbi Elazar, the Rabbi Shimon Matirin, Amar Yosef, 
Gavra Yitera Atal Ashminin Dear Rav Hashem Mili inform us there's an additional man. <laughs> in other words, what's the point of the whole mm-hmm. Just to show that Rabbi Shimon also joins into the argument. Amale Abaye Tuva Ka Mashmalan. Sorry, Tuva Ka Mashmalan. It informs us of much, Mr. De'i Mimaknitin. For if we had only learned from the Mishnah, Hava Amina, I would have said, Hatam Hu, it is only there with honeycombs we're talking about. Demeikara Uchla, Ulavasov Uchla. Since honey is the food in the beginning and remains the food in the end, when it oozes out, Aval Hacha, here, Demeikara Uchla, Ulavasov Mashke Ema Lot. Where the juice is a food in the beginning, but a beverage in the end, it's not permitted. So, aha, kamash malan, it informs us. That Rabbi Elazar rules leniently even in the case of olives and grapes. He has had it here. So now we have a lovely new Mishnah. Mishnah. Kol Sheba Bechamin Me'er Shabbat. Kol Sheba Bechamin Me'er Shabbat. Anything that was placed into hot water before Shabbat. Shorin. Kol Sheba Bechamin. Yeah. I would have said Chamin is hot water, but it's cooking. Shorin or Tor Bechamin Beshabbat, we may soak in hot water on Shabbat. Bechol Shelo Ba Bechamin Me'er Shabbat, and anything not placed in hot water before Shabbat. Midichin or Tor Bechamin Beshabbat, we may rinse only with hot water on Shabbat. But mm. we may not soak it. But we may not soak it. This is very interesting. I'm glad to be reading this. Chutz Min Hamalia Chayashan, except for an aged salted fish. The Kolias Haispanin, or a Spanish, salted Spanish mackerel, which may not even rinse with hot water on Shabbos. So when it, uh, okay. Shehadachatan zo hi gemar malachtan. For rinsing them completes their preparation which would be an additional act of cooking, which is therefore prohibited. It's the completion of the prohibited labour of cooking, <coughs> which is like the, the last hammer blow, the thing that completes the process, I would say. Which is forbidden. Mm. Okay. So, food that is further soaked in hot water after already having been cooked, kagon mai, such as what? Amara safra, kagon tanagola, tanagolta de rabiaba, such as the hen of rabiaba, which he would customarily soak for many days after cooking. Ah, uh, let's hear that. Mm-hmm. In case of the chicken of Rabbi Abba, mm-hmm. which for medical reasons was cooked so thoroughly that it completely dissolved. dissolved. It says here it was for medicinal reasons. Mm-hmm. So they agree on that. Amara Safra, Zimna Chada Ikla Itla Tam. One time I happened to go there. The Ochla and Mine, and he fed us. This dish, the eel or Rabbi Abba to Ashkayan Hamrabad Lata Tarfe, and had Rabbi Abba not given me three year old wine to drink, it's I would have been compelled to vomit. Sounds delicious. <laughs> Rabbi Ochnan Rake. 
Mikutach de Vavlae, Rabbi Yochanan from Eretz Yisrael, would spit upon the remember the memory of Babylonian Kutach sauce or dip made of bread crumbs and whey because he found it so disgusting. <laughs> Uh, we, remember, we've learnt about that. It seems to be in a condiment that was made with fermented salt and bread. Amar of Yosef. Veleruk anan mitanagolta de Rabiaba. But we, Babylonians, might spit upon the hen of Rabava. The odd, and furthermore, Amar of Gaza. Zimna chada iklait la tam. One time I happened to go there, to Israel. But avdit kutach de vavlae, and I prepared belayin kutach sheulu mine kol briche ma'arva. All the sick of the West begged for that kutach from Rav Gaza. Ah, that's a strange. Apparently, not everyone in Eretz Israel found it disgusting. The comment was. So all of this started up with with the best example they can give is the hen of Rev Abba. Hmm. And here there's a little comment. Some commentators explain this chicken was heavily salted. Therefore it was necessary to soak it after cooking it to temper the saltiness. And that's in relation to anything that was placed in hot water before Shabbos, we can soak in hot water on Shabbos. Yeah, with cod. I wonder what it means by soak in hot water. You just leave it in there. Yeah. With the fire still going. The other, remember the, the other thing was rinsing it. Yeah. You could do it on Shabbos. But if we're talking about the fire still going, do you reckon? I doubt I doubt I think we're talking about hot water being poured on the on Shabbat. On the other hand, if you think of the if the cooking's completed before Shabbat and that rule there's no cooking after cooking that's supplied on Shabbat which allows us to um, So they're trying the, to dilute the strength of the flavour. I was going to say Spanish cod which is um, salted. And it's used in kosher cooking in Italy. Um, it's inc- you can go to the markets and see it. It's absolutely rigid and encrusted with salt. What is it? Spanish cod. Uh-huh. Oh, I know that. Yes, mm. yes, yes, of course. And what you do is you, depending on who you're following... It tastes great, by the way. It does. You soak it for a day or two beforehand and keep changing the water. Yeah. And some places just you put it I mean, you've got lots of water, you just put it in the container and have a continual stream of water going through it, washing over it for twenty four hours or twenty days. Then you take it out and mm. cook it. So maybe what we're talking about is a situation like that too. Where you've this thing's been cooked before Shabbat. You know, it's salt's been washed away, it's been cooked, and then you're just pouring hot water, not boiling water, but hot water on it, on Shabbat to warm it so it can be. Mm. I think that might be what we're talking about. In Lisbon I saw, similar to what you saw, in there, I went to the supermarket. It was a gigantic, massive supermarket, and in the middle of, on a pallet, in the middle of an aisle, there was a stack of salted fish. Very odd. Like it was just stacked there. Not plastic wrapped or anything. No, no. You can see it in the in Queen Victoria market. Really? It was. It's a very. It was a very flat fish. Mm. Very wide. Yeah. Do you know what that is? Is that cod? Yes, that's a Spanish cod. Salted cod. I've been wondering for a long time exactly what that was. 
And it's very good. So you've been in Portugal. Yeah. yeah. Interesting things to see in Portugal. But they're mainly monasteries and churches. Hmm? Really. No, no, I've been in plenty. Uh, you were in Lisbon. Yep. Is what really um, the, the old city, the, the, oh, well, yeah. that rebuilt after the big earthquake in the 1700s. Right. What we loved seeing was all the houses with the coloured tiles. Ah, uh, yes, that's, that's a beautiful thing. So gorgeous. So beautiful. And they've got a, a large river. Hmm. What's the name of it? The Tagus. Tagus, that's it. And there's um, and there's a bridge from one side to the other because Lisbon spans hmm. over the river. Over the North Shore. Yeah, but much wider. Hmm. Um, in the same way, probably that um, Istanbul ah. is across to across the what's it called? Um, but the bridge was built to virtually the same um, designation as the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. Mm. And they've also got um, on the top of one of their hills one of those big Jesus statues. Uh, that I didn't know. It's not, I don't think it's as big as one as Rio. Which is something from Concrete Castle. Is that true? Mm. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the tiles and the buildings was a big one. That was beautiful. I remember coming back and thinking, oh, I just want to import tiles so people it, could it, do it on their own houses. It would be nice to do it. It would be gorgeous. I believe uh, I saw a film set in Barcelona, mm. and the scene was in a chemistry <coughs> shop also. <coughs> Sorry. <Yeah. coughs> the scene set in a chemist shop, and the chemist shop, had some columns and things outside, and inside it was all decorated with these multicolored tiles. It was very beautiful. Mm. Okay. That's thanks to the Arabs. <coughs> the Arabs? Well, the Arabs uh, dominated all that area for four or five hundred years. And they introduced all that sort of ceramic work or something. Ceramic uh, decoration. Sure. I suppose so. Okay. Now, the whole shaloba, bechamin, bechule, anything that was not placed in hot water before Shabbos, we may rinse with hot water on Shabbos, except for the aged salted fish or a salted Spanish mackerel. Hidiach ma'ay, one rinsed Spanish mackerel, what's the law? Amar of Yosef, hidiach chayav chatas. Amar ma berei dirabina, af. Anu af anan nami tanina. We too learnt this in our Mishnah as well. Chutz mi maliach yashan ve kol ha is panin, except for an aged salted fish or a Spanish mackerel. She hetachatan zo hi gemar malachan for their rinsing completes their preparation. Okay, which is biblically. Inappropriate. Yes. Shmamina. Learn from this. Yativ Rabbi Chia Bar Abba. I love how they say learn from this and then we're going to keep talking about it. Yativ Rabbi Chia Bar Abba Rabbi Yasi Kame de Rabbi Yochanan. Yativ Rabbi Yochanan Baka Menam Nem. So Rabbi Yochanan was sitting and dozing. Amale Rabbi Chia Bar Rabbi Le Rabbi Yasi. Mipnei ma ofot shebevavel shmenim. Why are the birds in Babylonia fatter than the ones here in Eretz Israel? Other than those in Eretz Israel. Amalei kalech lemidbar aza baracha shmenim mehen. We use growth hormones. No. Go to the Gaza desert and I will show you 
Birds that are fatter than them. Okay, so he doesn't really answer. He just says, no, I, I, I don't think theirs is so great when there are yeah. others that are even greater. No, uh, yeah, you know, why why is the stuff in Babylon better than it is in Ephesus? And else someone said, he said, oh, you know, you haven't really seen the good stuff. Ah, Go to Gaza. Perfect. Exactly. Mipne ma mo'adim shebe vavel smechim. Why the festivals in vavel more joyous than in Israel? Because they, Babylonian Jews, are poor, and so they love rejoicing the festivals. That is a huge, that's a massive statement, you know. That's really a massive statement. Which one? About how people who are poor enjoy, their, enjoy the festivals more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's expanded because in Babylonia they are poor and it is only on festivals that they have a lot of to eat which causes them to rejoice. Yeah. I think it's an indictment on our society and you know, just on humanity virtually. Why are the Torah scrolls of Babel adorned and Eretz Israel are not? Lefi she'enam b'nei Torah because the Babylonians are not Torah scholars of the caliber of Eretz Israel. If they would not distinguish themselves by dressing differently, How would they would not be respected for their Torah knowledge. Brilliant. Another indictment. Mipnei ma of de kochavim mezohamim, why are idolaters impure? Mipnei shachlin shekatsim or masim. They eat abominable creatures and crawling creatures, which I've seen. Yeah. Go to Bangkok. Yeah. Some of the foods, you know, in that Southeast Asian area, they just stomach sort of cringe just looking at them. Mm. I suppose, you know, if you're rejected. Today we have today we have fried masters. Deep fried, deep fried masters. But I can remember back in the sixties there was a period where um, they were marketing chocolates coated ants, and you could buy them at great expense in the food hall of David Jones in Sydney. <laughs> if only we could get a picture of that. Rabbi Yochanan awake to these questions and answers. Amalehu, dar dake, children, lo kach amarti lachem, heaven I said to you, emor lechokma achoti at, say to wisdom, you're my sister. Meaning, im baro lecha hadavar ka chotecha shehi, um If a matter of law is as clear to you as your sister is forbidden to you, you may repeat it. In love, law, Tom But if not, you may not repeat it. So why do you speak of these matters which are not clear to you? Amrulay, they said to him, Velema lan mar mehen. Let the master tell us some of these questions. Okay. So more definitive questions now. Mipnei ma ofot she bevavel shmeni ma le bezim bevavel nefeta mipnei she logalo because they were not exiled. Oh, so he's giving clearer answers. Yes. Ah. So, wait for it. Hang on, sorry. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Shemar, Shanan, Moav, Minura, the Shokeshu, 
El Shmara Vagola Lo Halach. Moab has been tranquil from its youth and it rests quiet upon its fleas, and into exile which has not gone, not gone. Therefore, its flavor has remained and its aroma has not changed. Okay, I shall read you the whole quote. Yeah. Moab has been at ease since his youth, and he has settled on his leaves, and he has not emptied from vessel to vessel, and did not go into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him, and his scent did not change. This is Jeremiah. Mm. Apparently, one who is not exiled retains his strength. So what's the saying? The Babylonian fowl, just a Babylon, ba- Babylonian fowl. That's their natural home. So that's why they 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 haven't been transferred to Israel. They're still in their natural place, and that's why they're fatter and better than the ones in Israel. And then it goes on. I would have. Um, do you think they're they're, they're making it's an allegory? Partly that, and partly it's the usual thing of you know we're going to find a scriptural basis to, for these statements or ideas. So why just so why would um, so why would someone from Babel why would someone who is exiled to Babel be better than someone according to that according to that Pasuk why would a Jew living in Babel be better than a Jew from Israel? Apropos, that section starts off here with this comment from Steinsalz. Apropos relations between the Jews of Eretz Yisrael and Babylonia. Yeah. The Ga- Gemara relates, then we go in Rabbi Chia, Ba Abba, etc., etc., mm. sitting before Rabbi Yochanan. Mm. Uh, so Steinsalz is making a relationship. Mm. In the meantime, the two of them converse while so Rabbi Yochanan was speaking. Because we know that. It's, it's interesting they use the word offot. Mm-hmm. Offot is a general word for all kinds of birds. Yeah. Uh, so even there, on a practical basis, you could say one of them said, why is it that the chickens in Babylonia are you know, fatter and better than those in Israel, and the other one's saying, oh, well, that's because you haven't been to Gaza to see the pheasants, the desert pheasants that are you know, running around there, which are much bigger than the Babylonian chickens. It says here, we see that exile undermines the existence of those who suffer it. Thus, the birds of Eretz Israel who suffered exile are not as fat as those of Babylonia who did not. It doesn't seem to... Because chickens originated originated in India. Mm-hmm. They would have then gone from India to Babylon, mm-hmm. and then they would have been raised in Israel after being brought there from Babylon. Right. So they would be regarding the chickens in Babylon, I'm only guessing, yeah, yeah. as being the natural home of chickens. Yeah. And that's the explanation why the chickens are scrawnier <coughs> in uh, Israel than they are in Babylon. Mm. But from where do we know that birds here in Israel were once exiled? The Tanya, Rabbi Yudomir, Chamishim Mushtaim Shana, Loavad, Loavara Ish, Bihuda, 52 years of exile, no man passed through Judea, Shnemar, Al Harim, Esa, Bechi, Venehi, Vegomer, Meof, Hashemai, Vad Behman, Nadedu, Nadedu Halchu. Upon the destruction of the hills, I will raise up weeping and wailing from the bird of the heavens until the beast all have wandered and gone. The quote's even longer than that, but anyway, it doesn't matter. 
Behema Bigmatria Chamishin the Tartain Havo. Beast has a numerical value of 52. Alluding to the fact that no one passed through for 52 years. From the verse cited in this, but I say it is clear that even the animals and birds were exiled, as it states, all have fled and gone. Amar Rabbi Yaakov Amar Rabbi Yochanan Kulan Chazru Chutz Mikolias Ha'is Panin All returned except the Spanish mackerel. Damar Mackerel ran off to Spain. Damar Rav Hane Madre De Vavel Mahadre Maya Le'ain Etam the sites of Babel returned water to Ain Etam. In Eretz Israel. And the fish also returned through these water courses. The high, but this one, the Spanish mackerel, Kevan de la Sharir Shidre. Since its backbone is not firm, Lomatse Salik could not ascend from Babel to Eretz Israel. Mipne ma moadim she bevavel smechim. Why the festival in Bavel more joyous? Mipne she lo hayu beota kala. Because the Babylonians, Babylonians were not in that curse. Dirtiv. Where's it from? Hosea. Be hishbati kol mesosa. And I shall end all her joy, her festivals, her new months, her Shabbat, and all her festivals. And it's written, Chodshechem, Modechem, Sana, Nafshi, Hayu, Alai, La Torah. The new months, new holidays, my soul hates, they have become a burden to me. My Hayu, Alai, La Torah. What does it mean they have become a burden to me? Amar Rabbi Lazar, Amar Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Lo Dayan LiIsrael She Chotin LePanai. It's not enough for Israel that they sin before me. Ela She Matrichin Oti Leida Ezo Gzeira Kasha Avi Aleihem. But they burden me to know the charge to bring should be upon them. They also burden me to know which harsh decree I should bring upon them. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Ein lecha kol regel veregel shelo ba'ata boleshet le tzipori. There was never a festival which a troop did not come to tzipori to plunder. Tzipori was near Tzfat, if I remember mm. correctly. He goes, he says, to conduct searches or to collect taxes. During a festival. Yeah. Amar Rabbi Chanina, Ein lecha kol regel v'regel, Shelo ba litveri egmon v'kamton uval z'mara. There was never a festival during which a governor, a ruler, or an official did not come to Tiveria to do the same thing. Well, of course, I mean, the festivals are ideal times for 
descend on a town to collect the taxes and so on, because the whole population will be gathered there. Um, and you can catch anybody who hasn't come up with their taxes. Right. No, but also, if you're celebrating too much, you know, like we said, the Shabbos table, beautifully, magnificently, lavishly, so it shows how much wealth you've got. So they descend on you, and you intentionally turn it the opposite way, and you just dull it all down, which would make it much, much worse mm. as a festival. And say, so, you know, I've got nothing, look at my mm. table. We haven't done anything special. We'd love to, but you, we know you're going to come and burden us. Why are the Torah scholars of Babylon adorned? They're not native to their, that locality, so they have to distinguish themselves. In my city, my name is enough. Belo Mata Totvai. In a city not my own, I rely on my clothing. Uh, which comes from Pasuk. Habaim Yashresh Yaakov Yatzitz Ufarach Yisrael. Those of Yaakov who came, who come, will take root. They will bud and show blossom. Israel. Where is that from? Yishayim. Tanei Rav Yosef. Elu Talmidei Chachamim Shebevel Shebevel Babel, these are the Torah scholars of Babel. She osin, titin, u frachin la Torah. You make buds and blossoms for the Torah. Mi pnei ma of de kochavim mezuhamin. Why are the idolaters impure? Shelo andu al har sinai. They didn't stand at har sinai. She be sha'a. She ba nachash al chava. Because at the time, at the moment that this serpent seduced Eve, Hetil ba Zuhama, he cast impurity into her, which was passed on uh, genetically. Israel shamzu al Harsinai Pasca Zuhamatan. For Israel who stood at Harsinai, their impurity was removed, and so they went back to an original state. Of the kochavim, shelo amdu al har sinai lo paska zuhamata. With idolaters who did not stand at har sinai, their impurity was not removed. Very similar to yeah. the Christian doctrine of original sin. Original sin, if you think about it. Next one's fairly short. Yes, of course, Peter.